Uh, welcome back to Think Tech. Uh, let's call this Energy 808, the cutting edge. We're going to talk about changes in the solar landscape. How fast can things move? Okay, with Josh Powell uh, of Revolution. Okay, Josh Powell, welcome to the show. Nice to see your smiling face. What is left of it? Thanks for welcoming me back, Jay. <laughs> okay. Um, Revolution, um, how, how is it doing in a, in a world of change? I want to investigate, inquire into the changes that are surrounding us and surrounding solar uh, in Hawaii and on the mainland, for that matter. Uh, so you, you were identifying a whole bunch of things um, that are very important for us to recognize. Uh, like, for example, grid services. What's happening there? I, you know, Hawaii is the most exciting place in the country for grid services, maybe one of the most, maybe the most exciting in the world. Um, you know, consumers right now in Hawaii have the opportunity to participate in multiple grid services programs um, on Oahu, uh, home battery rewards and battery bonus. Um, we, we see multiple new programs out there over the horizon. So most of these programs are five to 10 years and they, um, they give customers, in some cases, upfront cash for uh, adding their batteries to the grid um, and, and allowing HECO to have some ability to use them. Um, some of the misconceptions out there are that um, they'll completely use up your battery or you won't have any control. It actually, it's sort of limited um, limited scope. You know, it's usually just a couple hours when they're going to be using it or even just a few minutes. So, um you actually get kind of the best of both worlds. You're able to get some cash back for having your battery on the grid, both, you know, sometimes up front and, and monthly um, and uh, help the grid along the way. Um, you know, we're one of the first, you know, we're probably one of the first communities anywhere in the world to have the kind of storage capacity we already have behind the meter uh, at a distributed level. So, you know, we're, I think we have somewhere between 80 and a hundred megawatts. Um, you know, that's approaching 10% of grid capacity on Oahu. Not quite there, but, you know, you know, very few communities anywhere in the world that would have that kind of resource. And because it's already there, um, that can replace all sorts of other older technologies that the utility would have used to, to manage the grid, manage frequency, manage capacity, can take excess energy during the day, push it into those batteries, whether it's wind or solar or anything else, um, they can discharge it at peak, um, you know, discharge it at a third of the speed of light. So it's faster than any other generation technology available. And uh, it, I think it really changes the whole dynamic and we're, we're deploying it faster than, than any other place. So I think we're in effect, we're going to sort of prove the different types of programs that work well and, hopefully accelerate our transition away from fossil fuel. Well, you know, when you and I first met, we were both toddlers um, and <laughs> the solar installation, um, you know, industry was um, dealing with low hanging fruit. And there were a lot of people out there that were, you know, primary market. They wanted it. And right now, and they were on board about solar and renewable energy and so forth. And you know, get to a certain point, and maybe it's not so much low-hanging fruit. So I wanted to ask you the status of the low-hanging fruit these days. Are you, are you still trundling along with all kinds of new customers, new installations, or is is the market different now that the low-hanging fruit has already been picked, so to speak? So I'm. I, I think you know this, but I'm a strong believer that uh, at the distributed level, on buildings, parking lots. Et cetera, you know, we'll see virtually a hundred percent of of rooftops and and those places covered with, with energy producing PV. Um, you know, Hawaii. You know, I don't think that's every community. I think places like the Northeast. I mean, parts of the country where you've got a lot more trees. That's probably not going to happen. But maybe they get to fifty percent. Um, but there's all large parts of the country where I think what happens in Hawaii will happen elsewhere. Imagine. You know, California, Arizona, places like that, and and that also means that building materials are going to change. Not all of that PV is going to look like PV. Um, you know, we've we've done 
uh, Tesla solar roof. Uh, that's an integrated product. Looks just like a roof material. It doesn't. You can't really distinguish it from uh, another roof. It's pretty expensive right now, and it's not really appropriate for all places. But it's. Uh, but the product demonstrates um, how things will integrate. It sounds so, like you're talking think, about, you know, things other than straight rooftop residential. It sounds like uh, Revolution is expanding into more commercial, industrial uh, kinds of installations. Am I right? We've always been, we've, I mean, we've always done commercial. So I, you know, we'd call us a hybrid installer. Um, there's been time period, you know, the commercial market goes up and down more often than the residential market in our experience. So that's always been our steady state. But uh, yeah, we have a, a large number of commercial projects away right now. Um, a lot of them in the permitting process, which has gotten longer than it used to be. Um, but but our customers, I think, in general, understand that and um you know, are sort of prepared for those weights, but, um, but yeah, we've, we've seen a, I'd say a considerable uptick, you know, probably since about, you know, middle of last year, uh, mm. maybe fall of last mm. year, we, I think the business community really started to re-engage. Re-engage, you know, that's a, that suggests a correlation between uh, solar installations, the market we're talking about and COVID. Can you talk about that? Well, I mean, I don't know that it's actually COVID related in terms of this re-engagement. I think uh, uh, in this case, the war in Ukraine drove energy prices up and Hawaii is incredibly susceptible to the price of oil. And we've seen in the last year, prices go up at least 30% on Oahu in some cases more. And if you look back further, you know, people are, you know, if you go back to say, oh, 20, you know, 2015, 2016, you know, prices have essentially doubled uh, for energy. So, but that large surge this year that relates to oil, um, I think that uh, has, that's probably the biggest driver with the commercial market. The next thing is the Inflation Reduction Act. There's some really, you know, the incentives came back for a full 10 years. They restored to 30%. You know, business owners definitely take note of things like that. And um, I'd say one of the most interesting trends we're seeing in commercial is some of our customers from a decade ago are taking the system. We're ha they're having us take systems off and replace them with new systems. Mm, so for new technology, they're basically doing it over. Yeah, yeah. They oh. could, you know, in many cases, they're doubling the amount of energy they're producing. And when energy prices have doubled, you know, getting more energy out of that system is huge. What about what about China? You know, we have like tension, geopolitical tension going with. With China, some people think it's really threatening, um, and we have tariffs. Uh, how, how does that affect the? How does that affect the the price of the cells or whatever you acquire? Uh, you know the uh, uh, the other equipment you acquire, the, the inverters and the like from China, uh, and how does it affect your pricing to customers? Module manufacturing, uh, especially modules that come to the U.S., has been moving out of China for several years now because the, the tariff, tariffs have been in place for quite a while. So, it's, you know, most of that moved to, to Asia, like, you know, countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, some to Mexico, um, a little bit to Canada. Uh, the, but the Inflation Reduction Act has a bunch of incentives for U.S. manufacturing and an additional 10 percent if you use U.S. domestic product. So there's, a, there's four factories in the U.S. that I'm aware of right now. Um, you can, as you can imagine, their prices are pretty stable. Um, I suspect they, they'll, they may go up. Um, I think they'll go up in particular when the final guidance from the IRS comes out on the rules for domestic product that hasn't come out yet. Mm -hmm. So the bill was signed in August, still waiting for the government to release the exact rules on that, but it would probably come out very soon. What's interesting is there were only four factories prior to the Inflation Reduction Act. There are at least 30 that I'm aware of now in planning in the U.S. So well, that's good. The that point of we can the act is to, yeah. yeah. The point of the act is to incentivize domestic production of of modules, and if if the with what we're seeing in the planning, it takes a while to build a module factory. It's not a you don't do that in six months, but uh, I think I think you know given the length of the act, the ten year duration, I think it could build a a really strong manufacturing base, kind of like the Chips Act, just hasn't gotten the same publicity. How about chips? You need chips for electronic equipment. I suppose you need chips for this. 
Uh, how how's the availability of chips to supply line? I th general supply, I think, has improved. Um, you know, it's not like it was, let's say, a year ago or even six months ago. I, it's not. There's still improvements that need to be made, but um, we're not seeing major any major challenges in in uh, mod, in inverter supply. That's where the chips would be. Um, you know, we're a pretty large buyer, so you know we probably get a little help because of our scale. But uh, but I think in general that's that's um, improved. So good. So um, in terms of um, you know the cost to the consumer, uh, uh, comparing fossil fuel, you know, production and solar production, for example, um, you know, like Kauai is H KIUC has managed to reduce rates. I'm not so sure about uh, say the Big Island, which is still something close to fifty cents uh, from you know from the utility. Um, and I and I wonder uh, is is solar becoming competitive at, at well, the consumer level? You you think you just alluded to my my favorite case study. You know, I think I think someday in a business school they're gonna gonna look at Hawaii in the last decade. And uh, you know, KIUC made a decision to you know really integrate solar heavily at, at a distributed level and a and a utility scale level quite a while ago and at first that increased their prices and they you know they caught a little flack for it um but i think with the recent increase in oil prices we've seen that whole system invert and KIUC now has the lowest cost electricity in the state and uh the heco companies unfortunately are still have a little more oil in the system than than KIC and and so that has a, an immediate impact on rates. Um, I think it's spurring everybody to move faster, and so we've seen really positive things um, on all islands in the last, uh, I'd say, in the last year to two years, where um, the level of cooperation and desire to do distributed integration, uh, you know, utility scale projects are always challenging, but just from an entitlement perspective, they take usually take a couple of years at least. And as we see more of them, you know, you're going to get more opposition from people that live near them, things like that. Um, you know, the, the rooftop stuff really should just be, that's, that's our low hanging fruit, every single rooftop, every single parking lot, no reason why we can't integrate the PV there. No, I was going to ask you, you know what, it seems to me that this is a great time to consider uh, building um, a rooftop over your parking lot and putting yeah. solar on that rooftop. I, I've seen that in a number of installations. Uh, I recall, for example, uh, Spectrum, uh, you know, out out uh, in West Oahu has a, a whole series of rooftops for employee parking, and on the top there's solar. So it's almost like, why don't you, you know, build a shed, a shed-like structure? And, on top of your parking lot and put solar there and and that'd be a great platform are people doing that that was i think that spectrum project was one of the first uh in hawaii um and i'd say now in our book in our commercial book it's about 20 percent of our business um that's covered parking and it you know it can be on on top of a parking garage an elevated system can be uh in a parking lot um I kind of wonder why we don't have it on the entire rail. You know, we could we could have PV lining the entire system. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it, it, when you think about it, there's a lot of opportunity. You know, integrating it in in uh, in the in our public infrastructure and in our parking lots is kind of a no brainer. Um, yeah. Let's talk about people for a minute. A word, for example, um, on Kali Judd. He was a, a leader, uh, a pioneer. In, in not only uh, selling uh, uh, solar equipment, but also in manufacturing it. He had a factory in California uh, and he died recently. Can you talk about him for a minute? You know, I, I think a lot of people think of Coley Judd as the kind of the godfather of solar in Hawaii. And, uh, um, you know, he was a founder of HSEA, which is the, the our lobbying organization, Hawaii Solar Energy Association. Uh, Founded Inner Island Solar Solar Rig Company uh, Corporation. Um, 
you know, was an innovator in solar thermal. That was the first big solar boom in Hawaii. And uh, people forget that Hawaii still, I think, has something like 25% of all solar thermal systems in the United States. Um, we went through a huge boom due to state incentives. Um, and, uh, you know, Coley was a big part of that. Um, but, you know, he, he led um, the industry in a whole bunch of ways. He was a mentor to a lot of people. I certainly would consider him a mentor, an incredibly friendly human being and uh, generous. And, you know, he's missed. Um, yeah. And sudden, sudden. I saw yeah. him only two weeks ago. And there he was, uh, alive and well, and all of a sudden gone. Um, so anyway, uh, other people, uh, you, for example, and Colin Yost, uh, um, uh, a new member, hopefully, of the uh, PUC, and, and Dave Gorman. Uh, it's, it's like uh, uh, watching movable, movable chairs here. What's going on with Revolution? Well, Colin got, uh, I think, a fairly surprised appointment uh, by Governor Ige on his way out uh, in, in late October uh, of last year. And now he's he'll ultimately go before the Senate for confirmation, um, presumably. Um, but uh, you know he's he had always you know was a partner of ours at Revolution had always uh, um, had a, a a desire for public service beyond the business, and so I think when that opportunity came up, he uh, he really wanted to to step in, and uh, I think from our perspective, it's pretty special to have somebody in your business get appointed to the PUC. Traditionally, those people only came from utilities. And to have somebody coming from a solar business, I think, is really exciting. Um, I hope that uh, our utility welcomes him. And uh, um, I think, you know, I know as a, as a person, you know, knowing him well as a person, I, you know, he's uh, really committed to to public service and doing the right thing. And, and uh, I think it's really important timing for where Hawaii is headed. Yeah, he can't uh, be an owner of uh, Revolution anymore. No, no, he's, he's going to have yeah. to divest. Yeah. He had to exit the business in order to take that position. Yeah. yeah. Well, it'd be nice to see a, a solar expert in there in any event. And and, and what about uh, Dave Gorman? Are you guys going to shift up somehow? We, we promote, yeah, so Dave was promoted to president. Uh, I think, a, gosh, it's been a little bit. Like, that's not a super new thing. Um, and is running a number of aspects of the business, but uh, in particular the residential business, and that's our sort of biggest business segment. And uh, you know, you gotta you gotta progress, right? And sometimes it's important for leadership to you get a lot of new things when new leaders come into to play. That's I think one of the strongest things about our business over the years is we've had a fairly diversified partnership, and not all business owners like the idea of partnerships. I think for us, it's worked really well. We've had some exceptional people and it helps us to, this is a tricky business and it helps us to think, think around some of the corners. So. Yeah. Well, you know what, you know, um, uh, my, my recollection, my view of revolution is that um, beyond all other things that it's creative, it's a problem solving organization. And when you get in there and find that you have obstacles and the like, whether technological or governmental, you find a way around it and and you do the job. And I, I think you made a reputation early on uh, for being creative that way. Uh, are you still as creative? <laughs> I hope so. I think this is, I mean, that's probably one of the most exciting things about the business. And, uh, you know, I get really excited about the impact of uh, economics and how, you know, we're bringing sort of you know, people controlling their energy brings revenue back into their control. And I get excited about the economic impact of that on our society. Um, you know, other people are driven, I'm, you know, I'm also driven by climate change and sort of the importance of our work related to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, some people in our business, we have some extraordinary gifted folks that deal with the technical side. Um, I get excited about that too. But you know, there's folks in the business that know way more, you know, know so much more than I could ever uh, comprehend. And, you know, it, it is complicated. Um, it's gotten more complicated as we integrate these, you know, energy producing systems, energy producing, energy storing systems in homes. I think 
you know, you and I have had fun discussions about electrolyzers and hydrogen and other things like that. And I, you know, I certainly, you know, that I think as you bring, you know, the big buzzword right now is electrification. Um, you're starting to see products that will will start integrating capacitance storage. Most recently, cooktops that have little five kW batteries ingra- integrated into them. I, I think we're going to see a whole revolution in energy distribution and what it means, you know, what your energy means in in your home and your business. Um, and we're just at the very beginning of that. And um, I mean, Hawaii again is we're going to innovate a lot in Hawaii. We're going to develop a lot of the products and. Um, techniques to integrate them. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I think that's, there's great opportunity for growth in this, this business in Hawaii. Well, you know, there was a, there's a certain bill, I must say, I'm not aware of exactly what's happening with it, uh, that would have allowed a credit for the addition of battery of storage to an existing solar facility. And for reasons that were never clear or rational, uh, the legislature didn't want to take up that bill for the last four or five years. Um, and the only way you could get a credit for um, batteries uh, is to include them in a, in a new installation as part of a additional PV. Yeah. yeah. So why, why was that? And has it been resolved or, or, or is it still a problem to try to uh, get a credit for batteries that are being added on in, an existing uh, installation? You know, that's uh, the, uh, I don't, so I'm not sure. I know, I know about the past, the history there. Um, I'm not sure where we are. I hope we, uh, I hope we get it this year because the Inflation Reduction Act actually allows it. It made it very clear that um, batteries stand alone or can get the credit. They don't even have to be integrated. Um, and, you know, I think there's some wisdom in, in having them integrated, but, uh, but I think being able to add them to existing installations makes a ton of sense. And, the, you know, the state should support that and the credits should flow to it. Um, yeah. Well, so I hope absolutely. to see that. Yeah. Hope to see, see that. Everybody I talk to says the same thing. And yet it hasn't happened yet. Maybe this session. Who knows? The other thing I wanted to mention, it, <clears throat> and it flows out of that very discussion, is that back when, um, I think uh, we're old enough to remember this, uh, there was a competition among renewables, right? And the renewable portfolio included things other than solar. And as it worked out, you know, solar emerged as the leading, as the leading renewable, and it certainly is that today. And as and, you know, in terms of the um, you know the, the the market in general, it is that today on the mainland and maybe everywhere. But what happened to the other sources? What happened, for example, to wind? I remember first wind on Maui. And wind is still at least a theoretical option. Uh, geothermal has been sort of static. Um, you know, hydrogen, I'm not sure where that is and where that fits. But, you know, what happened to that portfolio idea of having multiple diversified sources of renewable other than solar? So I think, I mean, number one, wind is, at a, you know, certainly wind is generally almost always utility scale. It's still, you know, huge, you know, big on the mainland for sure. It's still very low cost as, as is large scale utility solar. I think the big differentiator though, is, you know, solar is the easiest to integrate at a site at any given site. So, you know, home business, whatever, you know, solar is just by far the simplest thing to integrate, to produce energy. It's also had greater improvements faster. um, I think from a technological point of view, um, I think that's what's led to dominance. And it, it, the materiality of photovoltaics is really interesting as you start to drill down. You know, we have several, um, you know, just like there are multiple chemistries of lithium batteries, there are, you know, dozens of different um, cell manufacturing techniques and and frankly, different um, different substrate products silicon and, and even some non-silicon uh, perovskites for example you know different technologies that um, are out you know some maybe five years some maybe 10 or 15 or 20 uh, but you're you know you're going to see a continual evolution of the products and some of those products will you know become you know really hard to even differentiate from the things we see as normal today you know even glass um, okay. so I well, think there's I mean, just a lot of room 
Yeah, a lot of room, and uh, there must be people working on all kinds of technologies uh, in the United States and elsewhere because, um, you know, energy is a big deal and will continue to be a big deal for the development of humankind. No question about that. But let me let me ask you about the New York Times article. No discussion of of uh, solar or interconnect uh, would be complete without reference to that. It was a major article only a few days ago in the New York Times talking about problems in interconnection across the country, and it talked about uh, you know the fact that there are some eight thousand projects in the United States that are not connected, and they are waiting on uh, permissions and approvals all over the place, a kind of huge, um, you know, ubiquitous bureaucracy that stops them. And and some of them, according to the article, have been waiting for four years. Uh, Many of them have been waiting for four years to be connected. Uh, When we talked about this before the show, you said, well, it doesn't affect, you know, uh, smaller installations, (laughs) rooftop. But, you know, in in a way, there's something to be learned from that article, Uh, not only on the national scale, not only on the, you know, utility scale, of solar and renewables, um, but probably also in Hawaii, because we're always concerned about delays, right? Well, uh, you know, our average permit time for a commercial project in Hawaii, even though it doesn't have to get into a major interconnection queue, this is just bureaucracy, uh, is about 12 months right now. And, you know, there, we're not the only industry affected by uh, challenges in the permitting process. Um, so that can be one element of that, and that affects any any project, whether it's distributed, you know, distributed level, commercial and residential, or utility scale. That article you're talking about is pretty specific to large scale projects and interconnection queues with utilities and with uh, ISOs. And I mean that's kind of common knowledge, and it's you know it's only going to get worse. Um, I, I think, you know, I. I I, I'm not, I'm a little pessimistic about the future of utility scale, and I think, you know, there are going to be more and more challenges um, where people just don't want large scale developments in their backyard. So a lot of the low hanging fruit there, you know, California, you know, gigawatts on, in the desert, you know, a lot of that stuff's been accomplished, and so the places where they can go next are, you know, going to going to have more, you know, you know, places where there's just more people living and things like that. And you're going to run into potentially some opposition where people don't necessarily want to see it in the landscape. Um, I, I really think distributed projects, like what we focus on, um, are necessarily less controversial. Like nobody really gets upset about another solar project going down on somebody's rooftop in Hawaii. It just isn't something we think much about anymore. It You know, 10 years ago, people, there was a little bit more talk of it, but it's really become a commonplace. And I think we're also going to see material integration. I mentioned earlier in the show, um, one product, and I think you're just going to see more and more of that to where you just don't notice it. It looks like your roof. It doesn't look like a bunch of panels. It, it just looks like the roof. And and then you'll see that in other building products too. Um, you could see it in siding, you could, you know, other, you know, building fenestration. Um, and so I think those things will happen over the next decade, and you'll see much, much more distributed generation. It also ultimately is far more beneficial to our society to have generation and storage at a site because then that site's resilient. And if if there's an issue with the grid or there's weather challenges, whatever, you know, you, you can have your system up and running no matter what. And I think in Hawaii with, you know, hurricanes uh, coming at us every year, um, there's huge benefits to having you know wide distribution of storage and and solar. How does it benefit me if my my neighbor down the block has rooftop solar, and we have an extreme weather, which we are going to have, no question, no question about it. How does that benefit me? What why is my world more sustainable because of what he's doing? So I mean, if in that case, like if your neighbor has it and you don't, um, you know. Part of the benefit is your neighbor is just not the problem. <laughs> you know, your neighbor no. is, has more, you know, a more sustainable uh, dwelling and they aren't going to need some of the services that you might need. So that's just, you know, more things are potentially available to you. 
in that case, I, I tend to think that I've got solar. Actually, my neighbor has solar. I guess my neighbor to on the other side doesn't. But I, I've always thought, you know, in that situation, we throw extension cords over the the fence, and and they can at least plug their refrigerator in. And you know, get things like that. So I think you know, any community we've seen, we see that everywhere, right? People help each other, and so the more of these systems that are out there, the more resilient we are as a community. And uh, you know, that I think is truly beneficial. And I think we've seen enough examples of it um, to to know that you know, having the distributed energy widely dispersed is is really beneficial. You know, I remember going to the Clean Energy Agreement uh, or a name like that under Linda Lingle, and it was in the state capitol in, in her uh, you know, gubernatorial office, and, and everybody was there, and the Department of Energy was there, and they all signed up on this agreement uh, you know, to move ahead on, on clean energy. And at the time, I don't know if you remember, but at the time, um, the, the question was whether the utility would build utility-scale renewable or whether it would leave it to installers like Revolution um, to build you know, rooftop uh, solar and the like. Um, and it seems to me we've moved we've moved forward on that. Although there have been you know moments when the utility was into utility scale solar in this state, uh, I suppose KIUC is a good example of that. Um, I, it doesn't seem to me, at least from this discussion, that that's where we're headed. Uh, that we're not necessarily. What I'm thinking is we're not necessarily headed to utility scale solar as much as we are headed to distributed solar. Am I right? I, I do. I think you're right. I, I think we'll see both. I don't mean to say that there's there's definitely utility scale stuff out there. Um, you know, we've worked on some utility scale stuff, and um, we, we certainly see that out there on the road too. But I think that, I think in Hawaii in particular, distributed solar is going to tend to win out. Um, you know, it's just more accessible. Uh, we're seeing larger rooftops. We're presently working on a almost two megawatt rooftop system. So. Um, you know, you're, you're, we're seeing more and more of that. Are we going to make our, our goal or target, Josh? What do you think? I think we'll beat it. Oh, <laughs> I, think we'll get there, I think we'll get there. I think we'll get there faster than the state uh, mandate. Yep. There's no reason right. why we shouldn't. And revolution will be there. Um, what, what, what are your, in a, in a word, in a minute, what are your expectations for how revolution will do? in this moving, this move ahead toward the target? Oh, I got to be careful here. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I think in many ways, we're the utility of the future. Um, you know, we, I think consumers need to understand what these energy systems are. And I think that's why we're seeing a market-based solution. I think communication and education is critical. And um, there's a whole bunch of work to do. We need a lot of people out on rooftops and a lot of really electricians and um, and a lot of people that engage with customers. And I think um, we've already adapted, you know, we've already built the business to do that. I think it's very hard to take an old business and a, and a model and change it to that. It, it doesn't mean that business goes away. I don't think the grid's going anywhere either. So I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a hybrid ultimately of the two forms of business that have to come together. And Hawaii is going to do that before a lot of places. But um, I, I think that means, the, you know, revolution. It means we have, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000 customers someday, maybe more. Wow. Um, and they're I customers who, who may be repeat customers. It's not, it's not oh, just are, a, a one-shot yeah. installation. It's more, right? Yeah. We have many repeat customers now. But it means, you know, as a solar business, we have to service those customers. We have to be available just like a utility. And what about the mainland? I know when we we've spoken before, you uh, you uh, Revolution um, had interests, had had offices on the mainland, activities on the mainland. How is that going? How is that doing? What's the future for that? Uh, growing rapidly. So I'm uh, I'm presently at one of those locations in Idaho, and uh, um, that business is doubling every year. Um, doing some exciting stuff. I, you'd be surprised some of the interesting customers. We do a lot of work with the Nez Pierce tribe here in Idaho. Um, they they have some interesting motivation. One of the big drivers for them is the dams, the hydro power, which is very cheap. In, and in sort of the Northwest is known for it, but it's also uh, killing 
going off the salmon. And so for them, uh, finding alternative means of good, clean energy that don't hurt the salmon is a big deal. Inextricably intertwined with the environment, however you look at it, and with climate change. And yeah. so you, you're doing more than just uh, installing solar. You're involved in this whole mesh of ideas and technologies that will hopefully mm, keep us keep us operating as a society. Uh, Josh Powell, uh, CEO of Revolution, uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, installer, solar installers in Hawaii, who actually spends time talking with me. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.